Hello everybody, let's talk about the loci or the loci method or however you choose to pronounce it. If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking and how things are going for you. We're going to go through these nine very, very practical tips. And of course, if you're joining us live, this is your chance to ask any questions you may have. If you're watching the replay, just go ahead and get involved in the discussion below. And one of the most amazing things about this technique is the more you use it, the better you get at it. But of course, you've got to use it in order to get better at it. Yes, Nick, this is live. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you here. We're doing this at a slightly different time than usual, but I figured now or never. So good to see you here. And if you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And uh, before we get started, as we're warming up, just so you know, last week's podcast was all about elaborative encoding. The whole blog is there for you and the recording is there for you and this image and its explanation is there for you. So it's a mnemonic example and something that you might find very, very practical. If you don't know Elmer Fudd, then obviously you want to understand the principles behind that choice, which is all explained for you there. So the link for that is in the description below. You can check that out. And uh, also, one thing I wanted to share with you, something cool in our, our uh, mastermind group. This is from someone under a code name, Kecko. Uh, I think that's how you would pronounce it. And this is a very, very interesting alternative to mind mapping. And it sort of evolves out of the Magnetic Mary Method training. So isn't that wonderful? I think that, that's very, very beautiful. And uh, I look at it a lot. It's very inspiring. All right, so MPC Tube is in the house from San Francisco. Hello, good to see you. Thanks for saying hello. Thanks for joining us. Nick is here in Bris Vegas, Queensland with me. Excellent, excellent. So that's wonderful. Now, we're going to go through these tips for you. And a lot of their impact will have a lot to do with where you are with the techniques. But I wanted to share this mind mapping approach for you because this individual codename Kecko is... Um, really compressing an entire training into one glance. And obviously there's some nitty gritty details there and so forth. But if you don't have the big picture, then it can be very, very difficult for any of these tips to actually fall into action. So the whole point here is, is get the big picture of memory techniques. That's the meta tip that, uh, <laughs> that we're going for here. And I just love seeing it all compressed into a single image. That's wonderful, don't you think? So if you haven't hit thumbs up yet, hit thumbs up for this because you can try this and see if it works for you to compress entire books into a single page, entire courses, etc. So you can see it at a glance, review it very quickly at a glance and uh, learn a lot faster and remember more. All right. So the first tip that I have for you is just to learn to use this method simply. And if you've taken, for example, the magnetic square course, then you know how to make it very, very simple. And, you know, don't overthink it. Don't overcomplicate it. We had a live stream previously about not overthinking the memory palace technique or anything like this. And it's amazing how easy it is to overthink it. It seems to seduce one into overthinking it. And yet we can think about it for the rest of our lives and think about it in ways that are extremely productive if we will just dive in and actually get the skill. So think about it in terms of fishing. You can have all kinds of endless ideas about f fishing that, you know, have nothing to do with the actual practice of it. Whereas you can have even better ideas about fishing when you go out into a boat and actually experience it and then everything becomes more real. So Nick says that the Magnetic Square course is awesome. Thank you for completing it. And yeah, it's really helped a lot of people. So uh, stay tuned for the next opportunity to join that when it comes. But that's the first thing. Just learn how to use it simply and be aware of how seductive the memory palace technique and method of loci, loci is for overthinking this and try to just make sure you get something something done without thinking about it too much. And again, it's very seductive because there's a lot of exponential math you can do in terms of, well, if I do this, then I'll have this many memory palaces and, and so on. Just nail it first. And then you can go into all kinds of amazing and wonderful applications once you have the basics. And that's the second practical tip for you. 
add complexity as your skills grow, but build upon an existing strength. So you can get very complex with the Memory Palace technique, but your progress with it is going to need to tap into existing competence. And so the more that you develop your existing competence, the more complexity that you can add. And it really does, like this image shows, weave together, become more intricate and interlocked. But you need the initial set in order to lock in other skills, right? So you can't get this wonderful honeycomb effect of many interlocked parts without a foundation set. So I think the main foundation is the memory palace technique. And then there are a number of techniques that we talk about, such as the peg word method, the major method, etc., which you can lock on to the core skills once that you have it. MPC tube says, I got your book and loved it. Thanks. Glad you loved it. Great to hear. And thanks for letting us know. That's wonderful. And love to hear more about which one and what you've been doing with it since that you got it. Appreciate that very much. So I hope that makes sense. You can add complexity as your skills grow. I add complexity as my own skills grow. And the cool thing is, is you also see where complexity is not necessarily desirable. Just because you can do certain things with this technique doesn't mean that you should or that you would necessarily benefit from them, but then you can see where you might benefit from them if you were to stretch, if you were to practice. Hello, love music, great to see you here. Thanks for saying hello. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, or if you're watching the replay, get involved in the discussion below. And always love to hear your thoughts. Always have these wonderful conversations in the discussion on the replays. And you know, if you don't go back and look at them, you might want to because there's some interesting things that come up in those discussion areas. All right, so that's the second tip for you. Next is to, once you're moving and shaking with, them, with, with a couple of memory palaces, then you want to experiment with having different sized journeys. Now, of course, before you start to have different sized journeys, you've also got to have more than one memory palace. You've got to have multiple memory palaces. And the more memory palaces you have, the more competence you develop with the skills and the more experience you're able to develop in terms of stretching your spatial memory. And spatial memory is a wonderful asset. The more you work with it, the more you develop, the more you're able to have space in which to use your tools and use the magnetic imagery you create and revisit it and really start to discover how that this memory palace can work to essentially create these little wormholes in a way where you don't have to reproduce so much information all the time because you're able to connect things together that you've already established. So you'll see that in practice. And it's likewise with journeys. And when you have bigger journeys and you use bigger journeys, then you can see the benefit of smaller journeys when you also have those smaller journeys. And you can see how memory palaces are often collections. Large memory palaces are really just collections of smaller memory palaces. So if we look back at this image and we sort of see this as, you know, we could think of this as a memory palace, but really if this is a segment inside of it, then this is another segment and this is another segment. At some level, this is a, um, a memory palace, this is a memory palace, and this is a memory palace inside of one larger memory palace. Hello, Ben. Thanks for joining us. Good to see you. So having different sized journeys is obviously a, uh, a wonderful thing to do and to see comparisons between how they work, to see how journeys are often just journeys inside of journeys. Uh, depends on how your segmentation works out, but you'll only ever experience that by having multiple different levels of journeys. So make sure you do that. Then another thing you want to explore is basically less is more. So it can be very, very useful to have super condensed memory palaces and uh, have those memory palaces filled and overloaded with tons and tons of stations and, and so forth. But it can also be very beneficial to see what happens when you have less and you work in a manner that is spaced out, that isn't as overloaded, so to speak. And the other way that you can apply white space is also to just memorize less, to actually encode less and see if you're able to have more recall from focusing on fewer pieces of information. 
And uh, that's a very interesting thing to do. Because you'll see how your brain actually can fill in the gaps. And one of the things that happens is a lot of people, they get a Dr. Faust kind of effect. And if you know the legend of Faust, he just wanted all the information in the world. This led to a downfall. Whereas if you can be a little bit more satisfied with the big ideas, you'll see that your mind actually will fill in all the blanks and you don't need that overload. So you, you, because you've focused on allowing your mind to fill in the blanks and just focused on the big ideas, the big levers. Then another tip for you is to have short-term and long-term projects. So classic sort of short-term project is a daily run through some playing cards. Memorize playing cards, or it can be that you work on a set of names that's very short-term, composers or whatever the case may be, and then a long-term project like learning a language or memorizing lots and lots of poetry or whatever the case may be. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. And as you move through short-term and long-term projects, you're going to have naturally different sized memory palaces for these, and you can then explore the difference between indoor and outdoor memory palaces. And this is a, a very, very powerful thing to do. And I've been challenging myself to do more outdoor palaces that are much longer and bigger in length. And it's really, really wonderful. But it goes back to that segmentation effect. So by treating it as one long, big memory palace, is it really the case that it's one long, big memory palace? Or is it really just a collection of many smaller memory palaces? And at some level, it is both. And it's just a very powerful thing to experience it being both at the same time to help improve your practice. And there are certain ways in which you can actually make outdoor memory palaces, indoor memory palaces that uh, are fun to explore. And then the other thing that I would suggest for you is that a lot of people ask me about the peg word method all the time and just pegs in general. And the thing to realize is that memory palaces, the method of loci, method of loci, is essentially just pegs and using space as pegs, right? And then you add features or you add designations to the space and now you're just adding a peg to a peg. So eventually here, we'll be talking about Bruno First's memory course, and that's essentially uh, what he suggests again and again and again. And uh, there is a, a blog post on the peg word method and a podcast you can listen to. VVK Anand says, I make videos of my memory palaces rather than drawing them. That's very interesting. Uh, I would... I would love to see some of those and perhaps um, hear more about the benefit. Have you in the past drawn your memory palaces and then added video as an alternative or have you only ever just done video and how much time does it take you to rehearse them or to review them? Do you actually review them? I'd love to hear more about how all that works. Then the next tip I would have for you is just persist. There's going to be challenges along the way. And one of the best ways to deal with those challenges is to make sure you have a good library of memory training that you actually go through it thoroughly and you go through it again and again and again, progressively over time. The thing about SIP is taking, is taking it one zip at a time is study the techniques, implement them and practice them. That's your SIP there. But you have to have a nice library that you can refer to again and again over time. Ideally one that is updated and upgraded, so to speak, and enables you to go deeper and deeper into the techniques and review and revisit. I have this tremendous library of memory books precisely for that purpose and all kinds of memory courses that I have access to for this purpose to go through again and again and again and, and deepen this because challenges will come. And it's not so much that you forget certain things, but that you haven't seen them from your experience. So, you know, there's multiple techniques that you may have learned or may have encountered, may have studied, may have seen examples of, but because you haven't gone out and gotten a certain amount of experience, it didn't really quite settle in your mind. And it might not have had the quality of experience that you're going to need going forward 
because you need to go back and review those things. So when trouble comes, it's often just a great thing to go in maybe five, 10 minutes on a particular topic, a particular technique, or spend an hour going through it. I remember on the, the last live stream, Adolfo talked about how he cherry picked through the masterclass, but only when he went back and actually paid the dues of going through it video by video and really understanding it after having taken some action that the technique started to pop for him to really soar. And that is true of many, many things in the world. You go through things, you skim things, you don't actually percolate them through implementation, which is our I in the SIP, you're going to miss out on so much vibrant potential and detail. So when those things happen, you want to make sure you have resources that you can revisit so you can persist and study one sip at a time by studying, implementing based on what you've studied, what you what your review has revealed to you that you may not have noticed or paid proper attention to the first time, and then continue to practice with information that improves your life. And this is sort of the number one thing is that a lot of people, they practice with things that actually make persistence difficult because they're not getting a payoff. They're not really getting these powerful boosts of brain chemicals that come with accomplishment to continue to encourage them to carry on like dopamine and all kinds of wonderful things that switch on all kinds of opioid receptors. So that's a huge tip for you. And we all need to persist. We Persistence is just going to be a requirement, no matter who you are or what it is that you're trying to do. And then here's the ninth tip for you. Keep a memory journal so that you actually have a place, a record of what you're doing, how you're doing it, and you're able to proceed and make sure you, you know where you're going. So I don't know if Nick is still here, but uh, I know he's got one of these uh, five-year snapshot journals, and they're absolutely fantastic for tracking all kinds of things progressively over time, keeping track of how many cards you memorized, for example, seeing some of the things like in the card memorization course, I recently updated it so you have some additional exercises to go through that uh, enable you to balance what's called the challenge frustration curve. And if you track that, you'll be able to see how you grow over time. And you could memorize what it is that you're, you're doing. You could <laughs> practice the memory techniques that way. But a much more sort of practical thing is to start to recorded in a journal. And one of the cool things about the Freedom Journal and the Mastery Journal is there's just, actually it's the Mastery Journal more than the Freedom Journal, where you have this little graph, but you can construct that graph for yourself on a 10 day basis in order to enable yourself to have progress. So um, one reminder for you, in case you haven't seen it yet, the blog post and podcast on elaborative encoding is available over on the blog. The link is down below. And that's it for today. Those are some tips for you for practicing and getting more out of this wonderful technique. Hope you enjoyed today's live stream. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.